start in about a minute. Uh, we're all set with uh, Adam, it's 30 minutes, then Aaron Obenua, 10 minutes each. I'll read the bios at the top and then open to Adam. Okay, well, I won't take 30 minutes, so we can move close <laughs> to discussion. Okay, but, cool. Yeah, It's so curious what our life has become in terms of giving <laughs> everything's online and virtual. When the world reopens, I will never again cancel plans. I will truly appreciate the opportunity to leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> I was just glad when they reopened the beach in the Caribbean. After the beach was reopened, that was quite good. To be quite honest. <laughs> so you left. The go ahead. I was going to say, so you left the Caribbean to go to the desert. Yes, indeed, indeed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting choice. Indeed. So I'm going to start now. Can I just, I see a question that's coming in. Um, just to confirm from Ali or Sepede, I'm assuming that only the panelists have the speaking option and other folks have the chat function. Is that the case? Uh, that's good. That's good. Okay. So just so everyone knows, if for some reason you want to um, raise your hand or participate in the discussion. I think the only way in which you can do that is through your chat uh, function on Zoom, unless you're on the panel. Um, and Ali, can I volunteer you to, if folks can pose any tech questions your way? Sure. Is that yeah. fine? Yeah, that's fine. All right, everyone. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good day. Uh, welcome to our, I believe this is our second uh, edition, our July edition of the Other Universals webinar series. Um, I am Victoria Collis Butelezi and I'm going to moderate today's seminar. Before I introduce our invited speaker, Adam Getachu, I'm just going to let you know a little bit about Other Universals. Universal's Thinking About Politics and Aesthetics from Postcolonial Locations is a supranational project supported by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, coordinated by Seren Pillay and the Center for Humanities Research at the University of the Western Cape. The project is a consortium of scholars across a number of universities in South Africa. This includes the University of the Western Cape, the University of Cape Town, and the, and the University of the Witwatersrand. Uh, in Ethiopia, the University of Addis Ababa, the American University of Beirut um, in the Middle East, the University of West Indies Cave Hill in the Caribbean, and the University of Ghana Legon in West Africa. Today, Adam Getachu will present from her 2019 monograph, World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall of Self-Determination, in which Getachu reconstructs an account of self-determination offered in the political thought of Black Atlantic anti-colonial nationalists during the height of decolonization in the 20th century. After uh, Adam speaks, uh, presents on, um, I think, the, the general arguments in world making. We're going to hear responses from Aaron Kamogisha and Obenoa Amponsa. Adam Getachu is Neubauer Family Assistant Professor of Political Science and the, and the college at the University of Chicago. She's a political theorist with research interests in the history of political thought, theories of race and empire, Black political thought and post-colonial political theory. 
Aaron Kamagish is Professor of Caribbean and Africana Thought at the University of the West Indies. He is the editor of six books on the Caribbean and Africana thought, on Caribbean and Africana thought, and author of Beyond Coloniality, Citizenship and Freedom in the Caribbean Intellectual Tradition. Obenoam Ponce is a PhD student at the University of the Witwatersrand in the Department of African Literature. Her research focuses on Pan-Africanism, womanism, and the intellectual contributions of Black women in Africa and the di African diaspora. Obeno is also the founder and principal of Obenoam Ponce and Associates, a company that offers training, coaching, and facilitation solutions to individuals as well as organizations. Previously, Obeno has served as executive director of the Harvard University Center for African Studies, Africa office here in Johannesburg, as well as the CEO of the Steve Biko Foundation. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Adam and uh, we'll begin. Thank you so much for doing this, Adam. This is uh, a wonderful project, amazing project. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Soren for the invitation and the fellow panelists for agreeing to discuss the book, um, and especially Aaron, who's doing it at 6 a.m. Um, and thanks to all of you who are joining from around the world. Uh, even though we can't see your faces, it's really wonderful to be part of this project and to discuss this book with you. Um, what I want to do is just give you a sense of where the project came from. Um, I know you've read parts of it already, so I will try not to do too much summary, but give you a broad survey of what I think I was trying to do in the book, what I've been thinking about a little bit since its publication last year. Um, so this book uh, first started out as a dissertation in African American studies and political science at Yale. And, um, you know, it's, it was written in the kind of um, in the 2000s and uh, the 2010s initially. And it came out of two sorts of problems, I would say, um, or questions about the world. Um, you know, I think at the, in the period that I was writing it, uh, we were sort of a decade into a resurgent American imperialism that had abdicated even a rhetorical commitment to uh, international law. I, I remember writing the proposal for the dissertation, which began with a, a kind of um, prologue around the intervention in Libya. And so even when kind of, you know, Bush was out and Obama was in, there was a sense that the kind of policies and programs initiated under the Bush administration would persist. And for, and in part, this, this, this set of policies and programs, I think, illustrated the waning of sovereign equality and non-intervention as norms of the international order. Um, so that was kind of the political context in which this project emerged for me. And in parallel to that, within my field of political theory, I encountered a kind of a version of cosmopolitanism that celebrated this very devaluation of sovereign equality and non-intervention, that celebrated the kind of waning of sovereignty as the emergence of what many call a post-Westphalian world order. Um, so I think in my view, that project of cosmopolitanism was one that was deeply tied uh, to the European experience of the post-war period but of course presented itself as a universal experience and your project is called an other universal. So I think it's really important to think about how that the particular, the particular and very specific trajectory of the European experience gets rendered as, as the universal. Um, and this project was one that saw then cosmopolitanism and internationalism as primarily responses to the Holocaust and interstate war um, especially World War II. So the problem of the 20th century from this perspective uh, was the view was from this view was that um, a problem of excessive and unrestrained state sovereignty. Um, and the, then the question for cosmopolitan theorists uh, working in this vein is um, to think about how to create legal and political constraints on sovereignty. Um, so from that perspective, then you can see why the end of sovereign equality might be a, cel a celebratory moment rather than a moment for pause and, and, and critique. 
So what my, what my book tried to do is point to a different set of dilemmas um, of international politics that emerge when we take empire and the struggle against it as the problem of the 20th century. After all, most of the world would, could not be said to have sovereignty at the close of the Second World War. Moreover, as critics, anti-imperial critics, uh, from Du Bois to, to Césaire have pointed out, even that story of the Holocaust and the interstate war of World War II were not necessarily intra-European stories, but deeply tied to the problem of empire. In fact, their primary, I think, one of the primary interventions of the scholars that I, or the thinking that I unearth is the idea that interstate war or global war had been caused by and facilitated by the structure of imperial hierarchy. So um, the, the book then asks uh, what happens when we center the experience of most of the world and the experience of empire as the grounds from which different ways of thinking about the international appeared and were articulated and contested in the period after World War II. Um, so this, this kind of overarching framework uh, generates, I think, a first question for me in the book, which was, what was empire? How was empire conceived by the set of thinkers I'm interested in in this book? And I think here I wanted to push back against the standard account of empire that treats empire as a problem of alien rule, uh, where one European state rules, dominates a, a colony, and that fixates on exclusion so that the colony is excluded from the international order. And this kind of account of empire often reads anti-imperialism then as a two-pronged you know, solution. One that tries to overcome alien rule and two that tries to seek inclusion within an already existing international order. Um, so my account, off, my account again called from a set of thinkers, um, Du Bois, Kwame Nkrumah, Eric Williams, George Padmore, and others, focuses on a different kind of problem, uh, one that I call unequal integration and, 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 and racial hierarchy. And here, um, um, the problem isn't so much that you're excluded from the internationalist society, but that you appear in that sphere as a subordinated member. Um, this also de-emphasizes slightly the question of alien rule. While it is true that alien rule would be the primary form of imperial domination, it doesn't have to be the, it certainly wasn't the only one. Um, so the, the early chapter of the book narrates this problem of unequal integration through the example of Ethiopia and Liberia and their burdened kind of unequal membership within the League of Nations. So I use the story of these two independent African states to dramatize the question of racial hierarchy, to show how here a, state, a set of states that are sovereign, that are recognized as sovereign, that are in fact members of the international order, are subject to various forms of domination, um, regardless of that status. And, and of course, in the case of Ethiopia, leading to um, the intervention by Italy in, 19, in 1935. So I think in the interwar period um, within this Black Atlantic network of intellectuals, um, of, pol of uh, political activists, of organizers, uh, there is a central fixation on one, the question, the status of, of these countries, of Ethiopia, Liberia, but also Haiti, which is occupied um, by the United States for most of the period. And you see this in, in, in texts such as Namdi Azikwe's uh, Liberia and World Politics that tries to think about what is the particular configuration of these, um, of these states within the international order. But I would say that racial hierarchy in this interwar period is not only a, a question of the status of sovereign states, but also a story of the global color line produced by the experience of transatlantic slavery. And here, um, Du Bois and, and Padmore in, in particular, but other thinkers I, I study also, trace a story of long continuity um, of Africa's relationship to the world as being structured by that experience of slavery. 
And there's two kinds of ways that they think about this connection uh, between the new imperialism of the 19th century and that older history of the slave trade. One is a, uh, is a kind of historical sequencing such that the new imperialism or imperial expansion in Africa is a project that's trying to make up for, that comes after abolition and is trying to make up for the loss of, of enslaved African labor. Um, so there's this historical way in which imperialism both uses the kind of uh, economic um, the profits generated from slavery to usher in a new imperialism. And then there's a structural a story of structural continuity, such that the earlier period of slavery and the slave trade and this later period of the new imperialism are, are both projects of trying to secure black labor. So that, and I think, again, I want to say, I think this is a really different way of thinking about the political economy of empire from this, from accounts that we, um, from the accounts offered, say, in uh, Lenin's imperialism of 1917 or Hobson's earlier study of 1902, where the preoccupation is on finance capital. So for this set of think thinkers, the primary economic conundrum that is, is, is this kind of, um, is the attempt to uh, fix and, and, and capture black labor. So um, that's sort of the kind of picture of empire that I, I draw out um, from this uh, set of thinkers. Um, and I argue that this conception of empire frames and orients uh, what I call in the book anti-colonial world making the project of securing an egalitarian world order. Um, this project takes three different uh, versions in the, in the book. Uh, there's a legal dimension, uh, which is, is, is told through the story of how the right to self-determination emerged within the UN. And I think that that's one of the chapters that was circulated. The second is a political, a story of political institutions about, and here is here I center the kind of project of federation, both the West Indian Federation and the attempt at a union of African states. Um, and then the third is an economic story. Um, and, and that's told I, through the, the kind of 1970s project of the new international economic order. So each of these are kind of, different ways of imagining um, what international equality and what sovereign equality requires and demands. Um, so I want to suggest, I want to now say what I think are three sort of takeaways from the book and then, and then um, to, and then point to some questions I have been wrestling with since, since, um, since writing it. So first, I, I think when framed against the, the kind of account of international racial hierarchy I was describing, even the least ambitious project of, of decolonization appears to be a kind of radical departure from the international order as it existed. So very often, something like the right to self-determination gets read as a kind of extension, expansion, universalization, of the UN Charter system. Um, but what I want to show is that sovereign equality was not a kind of European ideal that gets expanded out, but is really a, a kind of demand fr from the periphery that's radicalized uh, over the period of the, of the 30 years that the book really emphasizes and focuses on. So we should really think of, of sovereign equality and really an expansive vision of sovereign equality that would stretch on to become a kind of economic, that would stretch on to have an economic dimension as well, to be a product of the age of decolonization rather than one of the European state system. Um, so, so the second thing I think is that, um, I argue in the book that the project of national independence and nation building were intimately tied and connected to this project of world making. Um, so I think this gives us a framework both for conceiving of what the projects of decolonization required, namely they had that they had this nation building and world making di dimension, and that for a variety of figures, these two went hand in hand. 
I think it also gives us a way of a place from which to think uh, what the failures and limits of the decolonization project were, um, such that the kind of whatever we might take to be the failures or limits of, of that project have to be thought again at the at the at these two levels and they have to take into consideration um the specificity of po the post-colonial state formation um in this period and i think we can return to to this and i'll try to say something about 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 failure um i think this also gives us a different way of conceiving where i started with which is the birth the rise of um, a new american imperialism I, this this story is often told again as coming out of the end of the Cold War. It's the end of the Cold War that gives us the unipolar American-centered world. But I think you can also tell the story of Amer at least American abandonment of, of international institutions as a response to the revolution that decolonization was. So already by the 1970s, American statesmen are are, are describing the ways in which they have to abandon, uh, abandon institutions like the United Nations that they had created because they had been captured by post-colonial states. So there's a way, I think, to read the, the kind of last 30 years uh, as a response and reaction to the 30 years that followed the, the world, world War II and in which um, this project of anti-colonial world making were at their height. Um, so I'll turn now very quickly to say a few things about what I think are some unresolved questions and limits of the project. And again, I'll just name three. Um, I'm sure there'll be others we can discuss too. I think one is a question of what the status of what the status of race is in the international order. Um, so if you've read the whole book, you'll notice that race and racial hierarchy becomes less significant as the narrative of the book moves forward. And I don't think I have an adequate account of why that is the case. Why is it that the language of race, uh, say, really disappears by the time you get the arguments for a new international economic order. Now, I want to be clear, it's not that race disappears from debates in, in international politics, of course, um, especially the anti-apartheid struggle becomes a space in which a debate about race uh, and racial hierarchy persists, uh, even in, in spaces like the UN. But the racialization of sovereignty and thinking about the sovereignty of African and Caribbean states as as racialized in a particular way no longer is a critical language that at least this set of characters is using by the late 1960s and 1970s. Um, so I think it leads to a kind of question about, about what the limits of, of, dis, of describing sovereignty itself as racialized might be and how there might be a tension in the kind of interwar period where this, the kind of question of racialized black sovereignty and the question of the kind of global color line were really fused analytic lenses. And I think you see these coming apart in, by the 1970s. Um, second, I think, uh, so the book really celebrates uh, the internationalism of the age of decolonization and the ways that anti-colonial nationalists innovated ways of imagining the international order. But I think one of the real uh, ways in which most of the figures I write about um, are still, they all retain a way of thinking about the international that frequently analogizes the state to the individual. Um, now, one of the places you see this most, I think, is in the chapter on the new international economic order, where, say, a figure like Julius Nereri describes the post-colonial states as the workers of the world. Um, so there's a way that um, this analogization obviously obscures a whole set of things. And it is, it is also the kind of central way that even the Europe, uh, kind of beginning in the 18th century that European thinkers of the state system describe and think through the international order. So I think this is one way to think maybe about the persistence and legacies of that, of, of that language. Um, 
and the, in, in particular also the set of dilemmas that it raises uh, for the project of decolonization. Uh, finally, and related to this, is, is the way that um, the dominance of the language of dependence to describe the, both the international and domestic dimensions of colon, colonialism. So in some ways, part of how the analogy works for these thinkers is that they imagine empire to be kind of organized around concentric circles at the international level, at the domestic level, at the individual level. And there's a way of reading dependence as running all the way through those circles. And this is especially true for Nkrumah and Williams, um, who are fixated on the problem, on the dependence, both the dependence of the soon to be post-colonial state and the dependence what they take to be the dependence of post-colonial citizens themselves. Um, I think, you know, on the international stage, this anxiety about dependence, as I try to show, generates really creative ways of thinking about how, about the international order. On the domestic stage, so, though, um, it may be this language of dependence is one of the things that authorizes a kind of pedagogical conception of the state, a developmentalist vision of politics. Um, so it might be worth thinking then about alternative languages of critique and different and ways also that it may be that even if nation building and world making are entangled, it may be that the problem at the domestic in the domestic realm is different from the international realm. So I think this is just an invitation that to think with with anti-colonial critics and thinkers who aren't in this kind of cohort of, of figures I've centered, but who have other languages for diagnosing the problem of colonialism and its legacy. Um, so I'll stop there and let hear from the discussants. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, let's go to Aaron and then Obenoa. All right. So thank you very much, Adam, for um, your presentation. And um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the very rare pleasure that your book presents and how incredibly welcome it will be for scholars of intellectual history and political theory alike. Um, in reading it, I was reflecting on how much I really wished that the book had been available when I was doing my PhD 15 years ago. <laughs> As I'm sure many people who are doing doctorates in political science and political theory, which is a very Eurocentric discipline, of course, will actually think. Um, the book, for those who haven't read it, but who are listening in, is truly a marvel. It makes tremendous contributions to political theory, Africana intellectual history and social and political thought. And I was struck particularly though by the expansive range and ambition of it. And it's a range and ambition which I so much admire. And I hope that um, everyone will see this as more of a sign of the possibilities within the field, but also as part of the urgency of our moment, which demands grand vision and possibilities towards black freedom. Now, the comments I want to make um, surround the question of the problem of neocolonialism and internal class repression in the post-colonial state and the ways in which world making treats to these questions, uh, particularly its figuring of state actors cast as anti-colonial thinkers. I'm going to be particularly thinking of a number of Caribbean examples here, specifically really um, with fidelity to the book, Eric Williams and Michael Manley. But let me start at the beginning. Um, on the very first page, Geta Chu states that, and I quote, while the universalization of a nation state marked an important triumph over European imperialism, it has also come to represent a political form incapable of realizing the ideals of a democratic, egalitarian, and anti-imperial future, end quote. This term incapable gave me much to ponder and is of some surprise, raising the query of whether our post-colonial sorrow results from a disciplinary imperialism or the post-colonial nation state form itself, or if administrations and national projects as diversion as the democratic socialism in 1970s Jamaica, Tanzania under Nyerere, the Grenada Revolution, Burnham's Guyana, or the contemporary neocolonial state can be profitably connected together. Yet, and here I certainly agree with Getachew, 
uh, the end result of the end result of them all, today's neo-colonial neoliberal condition, does deserve great attention and consideration. And central to this, I would suggest, is interplay between their domestic and outwardly directed world-making policies. World-making astutely recovers the universal aspirations of anti-colonial nationalism, but simultaneously notes in considering its limitations that, and I quote, the post-colonial dilemmas that had propelled expansive projects of anti-colonial world-making appear to also narrow the possibilities for domestic dissent, end quote. And I wish to suggest that at this point, um, and at points like this, world making after empire strikes me as being a little too tentative in its assessment of the internal politics of the post colony and the effect this had on the fashioning of self determination at the height of decolonization. And if we are going to think with world making after empire, and I insist that we think with this very brilliant book and consider our post colonial predicament towards human freedom, we need to critically reflect on the post colonial state managers. And these post-colonial state managers are a group referred to by Walter Rodney as the comprador bourgeoisie of the Caribbean, content to proffer our resources and lives for the consumption of metropolitan populations and the perpetuation of neocolonial rule. This class, and again, um, when I um, start on my examples, I'm narrowing to the Caribbean. This class has been responsible for a series of historical compromises that have so attenuated any possibility of Caribbean freedom in the post-independence era. So we have the elite whose conservatism stalled the potential of a radical nationalist movement under the PNM in 19, late 1950s Trinidad. The middle classes who removed their capital and fled Jamaica, hobbling Manley's democratic socialism of the late 1970s the hostilities of socialism and black consciousness of the entire class spanning the region. And in what follows, I'm going to rely on two of Get to Choose Caribbean examples, Eric Williams and Michael Manley, to make these points about the neocolonial condition and think about another side of these thinkers. So um, Geddeshu notes Williams' claim that the party in he inaugurated, the People's National Movement, is part of a world movement against colonialism that emerged from the very colonials who formed part of the university generation of the 30s. And she groups him with Azakiwi um, and Kumran Padmore, who shaped the first phase of anti-colonial world making in the age of, um, of decolonization, undoubtedly. Williams was also, though, instrumental and an instrumental part of the first generation of post-colonial elite domination and did more than might be immediately apparent to hide his radical intellectual roots. And this is very well, well illustrated in his autobiography, Inward Hunger. Inward Hunger, the training of a prime minister, is a polemical, boastful, and highly, and highly tendentious in its scripted story, and much in concert with the temper of Williams's thought and work for the 1960s onwards. Without the distraction of tracing the detail, the alarming silences in it over the influences of C.L.R. James in his life, we might go to one famous paragraph, and this is Williams as he ponders his decision to leave the United States. But I had decided on my future. I would stick to the West Indies. West Indians had traditionally deserted the region. George Padmore for Africa, CLR James for the absurdities of world revolution, the traditional West Indians for the law and medicine. I would cultivate the Caribbean garden from Cuba to French Guiana. And when time came for the West Indian University, as come it must, I would be prepared to, leave, to play my part and to leave Washington. Rarely have the feelings of a Caribbean citizen in self-imposed exile overseas, yearning for a return to where their truest realization of life's meaning and happiness might be found, ever been written. The withering scorn, though, towards Padmore and James is also remarkable, as that is the first mention of James' autobiography. James, Williams' schoolteacher, mentor and advisor, James without which there would be no capitalism and slavery. Williams is in a hurry to deny any influence by James and the anti-colonial movement in England, even though intellectual histories of the period place him as a fellow traveler of the International Friends of Abyssinia movement. It is this thoroughgoing disavowal of these movements which complicate him as an anti-colonialist committed to world making. The first Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Williams represents one of the most intriguing puzzles for students of the region. 
It is hard not to feel a sense of awe at the charismatic appeal of Williams, which in 1956 allowed him to form, found the PNN and win elections within a year, one of the most striking stories of nationalist mobilization around a new political party in the Caribbean's history. Yet simultaneously, the other side of Williams's legacy is all too well known. His authoritarian impulses that we became, became clear within a couple decade, a couple years of independence, his later polemical writings on Caribbean history, which historian Elsa Gavaya famously described as new shibboleths, new shibboleths for old. In Williams, we see the politician turn, the historian turned politician, who when he casts his eye back to history, treats of it as a venue for political propaganda, a palmist of no mean order, whose, according to Guyanese critic Gordon Roller, obsessive factuality drains black experience of its humanity. The temper of Williams's language in his public addresses, his flair for the linguistic register of the streets, represented an exploitation of the captivating expressive possibilities of nation languages. His use of it was disconcerting to those on the receiving ends of his denunciations that caused them real social and material harm in small societies, and was merely the public face of the state terror that ultimately secured the regime. Williams, the model for Lloyd Best's term, Dr. Politics, was convinced that educated middle class professionals alone had the right to rule the newly emerging Caribbean states. Client politics in Trinidad and Tobago, awash with oil wealth in the 1970s, would take on forms of patronage and encourage cons conspicuous consumption unparalleled elsewhere in the region, and would nat naturally take an ethnic turn in which a relative weight ascribed to African and Indian culture by the state would be debated tenaciously through the 1990s. In Roller's reading, culture under Williams became a manipulable lever in an elaborate machinery of patronage on the part of a controlling elite and clientelism on the part of the common folk. Williams thus is um, difficult to assess um, as not much more than a liberal nationalist. In Michael Manley, we encounter a more thoroughgoingly radical figure, but one of whom criticism in his own time was far from absent. In 1975, Walter Rodney um, published an article titled Contemporary Political Trends in the English-Speaking Caribbean that remains remarkably insightful, even by the standards of a tremendous intellectual output of his life. Rodney commences with the observation that most Anglophone Caribbean states have now achieved constitutional independence, tying this historical development to the dra dramatic collapse of European empire in the then 30 years post-World War II. The limited character of that independence is the central part of Rodney's considerations, and in this essay he shows a substantial debt to Franz Fanon, or more specifically, the analysis of a colonial transitioning to independent third world state as developed by Fanon in the direction of the earth. The consolidation of a new form of rule in the post-colonial Caribbean represents a continued march of Western imperialism, but the emergence of new forms of politics require the use and clarification of the term neocolonialism. For Rodney, neocolonial politics are those that derive from the consolidation of the petty bourgeoisie as a class around the state. The appearance of this class over and over across various Caribbean territories and in regimes that claim political orientations that should be radically different from liberal democratic, democratic socialists to authoritarian states led Rodney to the declaration that to speak of petty bourgeois dictatorship in the English speaking Caribbean is no play with words. It's Rodney's characterization of Jamaica as pseudo socialists controlled by, and I quote, a section of the petty bourgeoisie that at least understands the need for rhetoric that was pro-Black, pro-African, and pro-socialist. And if this is a standard, and this is Rodney's view, and this is a standard view of the Caribbean left at that time. We might do well to recall that the left in Jamaica only relented and gave qualified support to the Manly administration after the extent of the CIA's involvement in Jamaican politics became clear. Now, while I wouldn't endorse Sylvia Winter's intense scorn for Michael Manley, she goes as far as to say that when Manley waived the rod he was given by Haile Selassie on a visit to Ethiopia, which Manley then transports to Jamaica and dubs the rod of correction in the 1972 election, um, Sylvia Winter says it was at this point that, and I quote, the Duvalierist temptation entered Jamaican politics. Uh, I won't quite endorse Sylvia on that, 
But the betrayal, though, the Caribbean left felt from Manley was not merely as a result of his turn to neoliberalism post-1989. Um, very well done um, by Geta Shiel when um, she notes in her prologue um, the discussion between Carrie Levitt and Michael Manley. But that wasn't really um, the signal betrayal for much of a Caribbean left. It was really more his famous betrayal of the People's Economic Plan, a plan that was prepared by George Bedford, Norman Gervan, and Michael Witter. Manley agreed to the plan, which apart, arguably apart from revolutionary Grenada was the most ambitious plan for socioeconomic sovereignty in the Anglophone region in the post-colonial era. He had second thoughts overnight, went to Parliament without uh, telling anyone, and announced that the country was going into uh, to the IMF, all in the 1970s. So the result of administrations from Williams to Manley to their far less progressive successors, and their amalgam of a genuflection to Western capital and its social order, all of the result of this has been a specifically Caribbean brand of social and economic conservatism wedded to coloniality, and a will Power over the only beings that it can subject those reduced to second class citizenship within the state. And that is part of a conundrum, of course, that the Caribbean finds itself in today. So, um, in closing, I wish to make a comment on Getachew's call for a post colonial cosmopolitanism that recenters the problem of empire. And perhaps we can discuss more um, how um, you're thinking about that um, in our discussion. Because I do wonder if beyond the very fraught term and legacy of cosmopolitanism, if there's not another vision of an alternative world order debated a century ago with considerable meaning for our time. When faced with this question of national self-determination for colonize, the great Marxist thinker Rosa Luxemburg a century ago summoned the following observation in a 1915 passage with which I'll end and with which I do believe resonates considerably today. International socialism recognizes the right of free independent nations with equal rights, but socialism alone can create such nations, can bring self-determination of their peoples. This slogan of socialism is like all its others, not an apology for existing conditions, but a guidepost, a spur for the revolutionary, regenerative, active policy of the proletariat. So long as capitalist states exist, i.e., so long as imperialist world policies determine and regulate the inner and outer life of a nation, there can be no national self-determination, either in war or in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, we will move to Obenoa and then we'll open for um, the panel to ask, I think, a few questions of each other and then for broader discussion. Thank you, Victoria. And thank you, Aaron and Adam. Congratulations on this work. It certainly struck me as a very relevant much needed and timely intervention in terms of enhancing our collective understanding of self-determination as well as decolonization. As I stated at the outset of world making after empire, common interpretations of Australian principles and ideals of self-determination have too often led scholars, students, and policymakers alike to the erroneous conclusion that decolonization was a so-called natural outcome of the imperial project, when in fact decolonization and mid 20th century ad advocacy around self-determination in the black world were the direct result of the agency, innovation, and values of people of African descent. In many ways, the positioning of world making after empire echoes the sentiment put forward by John Henry Clark, the 20th century African American scholar when he wrote, and I quote, we now realize, as never before, that during the second rise of Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries, the Europeans not only colonized most of the world, but they also colonized and began to monopolize the interpretation of history, particularly African history, end quote. World making after empire contributes to the dismantling of this monopoly and helps to democratize our understanding of this moment in history. And by critically engaging normative interpretations of this era is in and of itself a contribution to the decolonization process. And this is a particularly timely intervention as decolonization is once again at the forefront of public discourse globally. With the formation of the movement for Black Lives seven years ago and its global expansion and recent 
recent months. There have been renewed calls for, calls for reparations, the removal of colonial statues and other empire, as well as calls for curriculum and economic reform cows around the world, which I think world making after empire in the, pro, in the epilogue rightly frames these calls as part of the new generation's efforts to continue the work of decolonization today. By expanding our understanding of the principle of self-determination and its facilitation of political decolonization, world making after empire not only gives us better, a better view of historic events, but potentially holds lessons for contemporary actors. As the author outlines in chapter one, and I quote, rethinking the animating questions and political aims of anti-colonial nationalism on its own terms provides resources for critically evaluating the contemporary predicaments of post-colonial sovereignty end quote. And I'm engaging the work in this spirit, that there might be themes that are particularly useful resources for considering these post-colonial predicaments today. And in that vein, I have three particular themes that stand out to me from the work, but also two questions that I'd welcome additional insight into. The first two themes of Pan-Africanism and the Black intellectual tradition are related and they speak to the critical role transnational engagement played in advancing the decolonial movement. World Making After Empire's novel interpretation of this history demonstrates the manner in which Pan-Africanists not only responded to the oppression they encountered in the world, but sought to remake the world itself. All too often in contemporary discourse, Pan-Africanism is utilized to evoke an emotional nostalgia, in some ways what Aaron was just describing, uh, around uh, this highly celeste, the route of, of correction. But in addition to being utilized to evoke an emotional nostalgia, one which recalls a time of greater optimism, when many of the countries on the continent and Caribbean were dreaming of political freedom and pursuing Kwame Nkrumah's advice to seek first the political kingdom and that all other things would be added unto you. Pan-Africanism also arouses memories of time before the Black Atlantic learned that political freedom wasn't enough before too many black states experienced coups, the proxy wars of the Cold War and the HIV AIDS pandemic. Yet in highlighting the Pan-African Pan relationships between thinkers such as Paulette Nardal and Leopold Senghor from Francophone colonies of Padamore and Krumah and others in Anglophone Africa, as well as Du Bois in America, we're again reminded of the depth of our inheritance in the black intellectual tradition. In World Making After Empire, we see how Black nationalism, the Black international, and Pan-Africanist principles were drawn upon to frame Black thought, to develop an analysis of the oppressions faced by people of African descent, and to organize collective action to address these oppressions. These collective actions, whether literary salons, economic cooperatives, or demands authored at Pan-African Congresses, contribute to, contributed to multilateral action in the form of the United Nations and decolonization. For the world makers highlighted in this work, engaging imperial powers as independent states would have undoubtedly curtailed what was possible for new emerging states, which raises the question of how, or even to if, contemporary multilateral institutions representing people of African descent can again begin to draw on these intellectual legacies to develop praxis for the 21st century and to once again remake the world. Another theme that stands out for me is that of language, its appropriation and misappropriation. As world making after empire details, by co-opting imperial language, African and Caribbean actors were able to give terms such as self-determination, new meaning in order to advance the decolonial project. However, the use of imperial language also meant that the moment of decolonization is often interpreted through a European lens, as you alluded to earlier, and viewed as imperial benevolence. Additionally, to borrow from Audre Lorde, while this use of the master's language did create space for decolonization to become a possibility, the language of self-determination was not able to fully dismantle the master's house. Instead, European nations were able to reclaim the language and close the very space ideals of self-determination fostered. And this question of the use of language is particularly salient for contemporary movements today. One example that is top of mind is the movement for Black Lives and discourse around the terminology, for instance, of defunding the police. It raises the question of would it be more strategic in the short run to use more palatable language, such as fund communities, or is deliberately using oppositional terminology of the movement's own creation 
such as defund the police, a more strategic choice for the long-term abolition of police and prisons. By choosing to create new terminology, in other words, and to use one's own tools, perhaps a broader scope for action becomes possible and would have remained possible in the instance that we're speaking of in this work. In addition to offering these insights to contemporary movements for decolonization, world making after empire raises two critical questions for me. The first relates to the paucity of women who are highlighted in the book. I would welcome correction, but beyond a passing reference to Paulette Nardal, there are a few, if any other black women who are cited as contributors to this moment in history. Understandably, due to the structures of exclusion that were norms in society at the time, there were few black women who were formally involved in bilateral and multilateral institutions at the level of the state. However, this exclusion could lead to the erroneous interpretation that there were no women of African descent who were contributors to national decolonization, when in fact some of the key intellectual traditions that gave rise to the period, black internationalism, black nationalism, and pan-Africanism, were largely shaped and spread by women. And while there were few women who would have operated in the arena of the state, there were certainly some. One that comes to mind is Mary McLeod Bethune, an African-American pan-Africanist and the only black woman who was a member of the US's delegation to the drafting of the UN Charter. Bethune explicitly tied her participation as a black American to the fate of colonized peoples when she stated, through this conference, the Negro becomes closely allied with the darker races of the world. But more importantly, he becomes integrated into the structure of the peace and freedom of all people everywhere. In some ways, Bethune is echoing the very sentiments of the world makers featured in this book. I don't raise the lack of women out of an abundance of political correctness, but from the perspective that one, if this work is about reframing black people as agents of their own history and not as heirs of Westphalian benevolence, shouldn't black women be recognized as part of the discourse and as world makers in their own rights? Secondly, by aligning the contributions of black women, my sense is that we perhaps miss out on a broader perspective and deeper understanding of this historical moment. And finally, in looking to elicit lessons for contemporary decolonial movements, many of which are demanding an intersectional approach to change and understanding of if and how gender was considered and navigated in this context would prove to be instructive in this moment. Finally, my second question then relates to the choice to forego any in-depth engagement with the domestic affairs of the states in question during this period of decolonization. While it's understandable that any project must be limited in scope, it's challenging to reconcile these world makers' global rhetoric of rights and self-determination with the repressions taking place domestically. And while I take the point that given the fragility of sovereignty at that time, dissent was too often viewed as subversion, with only the broad, that broad analysis, perhaps it lends to an overly generous interpretation of the actions of black heads of state, both in the Caribbean as well as in Africa. And as this has been delved into extensively by Aaron, I will end there, but I would welcome your insight into these questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you both uh, for these questions and comments. Um, I'll just, what I want to maybe do is talk about the, I think there's two, actually, Obenoa's last two questions come up in Aaron's comments as well, so I'll try to an answer and th think through those two and then um, maybe get to some of Aaron's comments as well. Um, so I think, yeah, one of the, you know, real, uh, I think, limits, as you both point out, is how the decision to tell the story through uh, basically heads of state and what that obscures about who exactly is involved in the project and um, and also kind of um, downplays a lot of the kind of internal criticism. So, in, so I think one, we might think as Obena was, was saying in her first comment that this is a tradition, a black intellectual tradition, a pan-African tradition of thought, um, but not one that speaks with one voice, that there are a whole set of debates about um, in which this set of figures is involved, but by having only told their side of the story, we don't get a sense of that wider kind of conversation that has, that's happening even at, in their, as, as they're in office. Um, so I think um, 
this comes up in two ways. One, I, th one, I think the, as you were saying, the absence of women in the story, um, I mean, it is a, tr it, it is a feature or function of having selected statesmen basically as the kind of narrative, but it, it, it does two things, I think, to the narrative. It's, as you, it, um, it disappears not just the the broader tradition of people who are engaged in the project of rethinking self-determination and it also obscures what would happen if we if we um explicitly center gender as a category of analysis here so i think there's two ways that we might think about doing that one um is about the ways that the debate about sovereignty is always a kind of gendered debate, always. Like the, um, this is kind of coming out of the work that Michelle Stevens has done for the interwar period, but the ways, for instance, that she traces the kind of deep entanglements between black internationalist thinking and rethinking of sovereignty and the figuring of black masculinity. Um, so I think one way of like, me, trying to extend and expand what I produced here is to think about the ways that black masculinity re remains a kind of central fixation, e even in this period of rethinking sovereignty. Um, I think other, someone put Annette Joseph Gabriel's new book in the chat, um, but there is also that once you expand out from the central thinker or the, the, cent the statesmen that are centered in this book, uh, you also get a kind of, a skepticism about some of these projects, right? So for instance, um, 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 engagements with the West Indian Federation, uh, there, are, there are figures who would be much more critical of the, of the ways in which Eric Williams and Kwame Nkrumah are obsessed with the American example um, and who center the kind of model of, of centralized sovereign authority as the central goal of, of, um, of the Federation and who have a much more decentralized vision of what, of what the Federation ought to do. So in some ways, I guess what I'm suggesting is that the, um, I mean, I'm taking on the criticism and saying that I think had, had you told the story from non-state, the perspective of non-state actors uh, who, are, who are part of the tradition of, of, this, of, of Pan-African Pan thought, but who are, you know, um, who are critical interlocutors of, the, of this set of figures, all of these projects look um, much more ambivalent, I think, than, than they appear from the perspective of the book. I think this is, in some ways, maybe also a comment and a reflection on what the limits are of trying to, as I narrated, I wrote this book as a response to a particular kind of conversation around cosmopolitanism. And maybe this is also a moment to reflect on what, what the limits are of constantly framing Pan-Africanism or anti-colonial thought as a set of responses to a Eurocentric canon. Like what if we gave up on that project of trying to articulate response and maybe focused much more on delineating and detailing the tradition on its own terms. Um, and I think that opens up the space then to think more about what are the kind of, what are the driving questions within, within the tradition and how do figures have different kinds of um, responses to, uh, to those questions. Uh, I think this is kind of related a little bit to where I ended my own comments, but for instance, I said that I think one, one kind of fixation that especially appears in the thought of Eric Williams and Nkrumah, but I think again, all of these figures are engaged in it, is this anxiety, the, the, is this anxiety that the thing that you have to overcome is dependence. And as I said, especially in the domestic sphere, and this, both of you reflected on the kind of um, the authoritarianism of, of, the demo, of the domestic sphere, that, that kind of preoccupation with dependence as the primary problem you're trying to overcome, I think is deeply tied to both of their visions of politics as pedagogical, as a form of paternal rule in some way that one has to engage in, you have to make people free 
uh, by transforming them in these radical ways. And, um, and I, in, in some ways, the Nkrumah estate was the, a model of this vision of trying to transform um, uh, what, dependent colonial subjects into independent post-colonial citizens. And this is, a, of course, a highly coercive vision of politics and of, 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 um, of the state. It would, it's interesting then to think about what were alternative visions of what the problem of colonialism was. And I think um, Aaron's book, which focuses on Sylvia Winter and CLR James, gives a different a set of actors who thought that the problem wasn't dependent, you know, that post-colonial citizens were dependent and one had to overcome their dependence, but that there is a structure of sovereign rule and that the real problem is sovereignty itself is the problem or, or politics predicated on ruling others um, in a paternalistic way, which is a kind of a colonial there in both Winter and in James, um, you, and I think Rodney and others, you get a much more, um, you get an account of decolonization that's really trying to move much further away from the sovereign state model than this set of figures do here. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think the focus on this set of figures then in some ways stabilizes, obscures the fact that for whom that, that story um, was a limited and partial story of what decolonization required. Um, maybe I'll, can I leave, I'll leave it there for now and then I think other things can come up in the questions. Uh, one brief, if I may, Victoria. Yes, yep. um, uh, one brief thing I did want to say, um, Adam, um, is that um, I certainly want to make it clear that my comments um, shouldn't be construed as making the great mistake of our viewers, which is um, speaking about the book you would have wanted someone to write rather than uh, or the book you wanted to see rather than the book she wrote. Because um, the small question I want to ask you here, I was so incredibly impressed by the range and ambition of the book. And um, it's quite extraordinary, especially in um, first projects and first studies. And I guess I wanted to ask you, why did you decide to do so much? Because just simply the range of archives and what you treat in the different chapters. Um, and even there, if there are specifics, like let's say I'm a Caribbeanist, so I might read the thing on Federation, I might well, you know, there's that nuance there that I would have put it, you know, <laughs> which is not really necessary or not really thing. What impresses me the most is the fundamental range. And I wondered if you might speak a bit more about how you conceived the project and why you decided on that particular kind of range for the project. Okay, well, I'll say one thing about why, why focus on statesmen in the first place. And I think I really wanted to tell a story, and I, again, I don't know, as I was saying, I don't know if this is a necessary thing to do, but one that was like, here are the, these are the institutions of the post-war war world order, the UN, etc. And I wanted actors who, who, who were in those spaces, basically, or who related to those spaces. Um, so I think that kind of narrowed the focus on statesmen, but you're right, in another way, the book is really broad, it tries to cover um, a variety of regions. And I think it goes a little back to um, Obenoa's co comment about Pan-African tradition. And I kind of think in some ways the 19th and 20th century produced two visions of universals, of Marxism mm -hmm. and Pan-Africanism, that Pan-Africanism has itself a kind of globe-spanning, it is a globe-spanning project. And I, I think I wanted to, I wanted range because I wanted to capture its global, globality in that kind of way. That's one. Two, um, you know, I use the language of Black Atlantic, of course, of the Gilroy's language. Um, but 
his, uh, his own use of it centers the African diaspora and especially African American thinkers. And I was really interested in a story that kind of kept, um, kept its perspective on both sides of the Atlantic simultaneously. And the way to do that was through this, this set of chapters that tried to pair um, African, Caribbean, an African and Caribbean case simultaneously. Um, so that's to, to, the, to read Federation as a project that's happening on both sides of the Atlantic at the same time, to think of the new international economic order as, as a project that's being thought through and, and debated on both sides of the Atlantic, et cetera. So there's a way of trying to keep Africa and the diaspora in view simultaneously. Okay, got that. Yeah, yeah, no. Okay. So I want to pull up. Um, I there's a question for Adam and Aaron, but um, before getting to that, I almost wanted to uh, ask you, Adam, if you could. There's, there's something to the way in which you have back to the project both now and in your initial comments that I want to ask you to spend a bit of time talking, and this is not necessarily your terminology, but talking about what the significance of focusing on statesmen is in terms of the question of um, black statecraft. Right, because I, I think that's, um, that is a key, when we think often about Black thought in relation to liberation, decolonization, we're not always explicitly thinking of it, even when we are using figures who end up in the state, we're not always thinking about it in terms of how Black states operate and form and that you may have another term that you want to use but that was something that struck me and then i will put with that um the question is there are two questions now actually uh, i'm just scrolling up in the chat uh, are there any commonalities between your view of cosmopolitanism and kruma's triple heritage to both Adam and Aaron, and from Mohammed Motala, can the speaker say something about the nature of current movement building and current struggles shaping their analysis in the context of how historically struggle has shaped where we are? Okay, good questions. Um, I think the, I'll start with the question about black, black statecraft. I like that language. Um, you know, I think one other impulse of the project, as I said, I uh, sort of, this project came out of a dissertation that was partly written in African American studies and partly in the political science department. And I think in some one sort of conversation that I was interested in intervening in is, 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 is um, the scholarship on black internationalism. Um, I mentioned Steve, Michelle Stevens' book, but of course, Brent Hayes Edwards, a whole series of Minka Makalani, a whole set of figures who've really focused on the interwar period as the high point of internationalism. Um, I think in some ways, um, you know, and part, partly, I think not always explicitly, but sometimes, uh, but it's always there that part of the retreat or the interest in the interwar period is it's before the state becomes the dominant form of, of poli international politics. So there's also a way that the kind of our disappointments about the, the failures and limits of the decolonizing project after World War II, I think propelled this interest and investment in that interwar period. And it is a kind of a much richer kind of period of internationalist imagination in part because it, does not yet have to deal with the kind of dominance of the state form. Um, but what I wanted to do a little bit was uh, acknowledge that rich tradition, but try to think about the ways it, it persists and re got reconfigured in different ways when the state form did become dominant after World War II and when, you know, when it was, didn't feel like there were 
alternatives to it, there was still this possibility of reimagining what it meant. Um, so I think so I think that was uh, really important to me. I guess, and this kind of I mean reminds me of something Aaron said uh, about um, you know he had he had quoted quoted Rosa Luxemburg and thinking about world revolution as really the kind of decolonizing project. It's not that I disagree with that. I think what I was trying to um, uh, sort of chronicle in some ways in the book is to say, even when it did not feel, even to someone like George Padmore, who had dedicated his life to the project of world revolution, even for someone like him by the 1950s, that doesn't seem like on the horizon anymore. Right. And so in some ways, you could say that the project of formal decolonization begins with a certain kind of defeat, a defeat of a prior vision of world revolution or, or transformation that had not been tied to um, that had not been tied to the state form. But I wanted to say, well, even when that revolutionary moment had collapsed or failed and we might have different accounts of why that was, this was a there was still this this kind of possibility of transforming what limited what limited resource there was i.e the state system um so i was interested i think and i think maybe the book could have framed that a little better in terms of thinking about um i say this at the epilogue but i think one of the things that's really compelling to me about this set of characters and this moment is that it's it's an attempt to imagine a world in a in circumstances of like closure political closure not political openness and that's why it's much more like our moment now than i think the interwar period is um because i do think that period was a much more open period it's right after the russian revolution there's a it seemed um, a much more uh, kind of it seems to me a much more open moment um so anyway i was really interested in thinking about how political closure can still generate alternatives. Um, I think of uh, Victoria, though, I feel like there's also, I can't, I don't really have an answer to this, but I am very interested in, in black states, in Haiti, in Ethiopia, in Liberia, as these kind of, as sort of utopian, you know, as, as having been imbued with kind of utopian possibility of black self-rule even if their realities don't actually match that. Um, maybe I'll let Aaron, I've talked a lot. So Aaron, do you want to take up the question a little bit about cosmopolitanism and I can jump in? <laughs> actually, not so much, especially. I hope okay. would take that because I was thinking, I haven't read in Kumar in so long. that. <laughs> I'm not sure how much I can add there. Um, uh, I mean, I, I have my, um, Cosmopolitanism has always been a very ambivalent and fraught term for me. Um, uh, a lot of my view on it, I have to admit, is borrowed from uh, what I thought was Timothy Brennan's remarkable book, uh, At Home in the World, Cosmopolitanism Now, and the criticism that he has of cosmopolitanism in that book. I just wonder, though, about um, if um, you make the distinction, Adam, between cosmopolitanism and internationalism, OK? um uh, which some make um do you make that particular distinction and how do you see or how are you thinking of crafting a post-colonial cosmopolitanism and what is its relationship then to a possibly resurgent socialist project in the world mm. okay um i thought i was deflecting but the question just got harder um you know, in some ways, I think now that the book is out, uh, I, I think it's, I'll say that I sort of regret how much cosmopolitanism framed the book. Um, you know, I think as I, I was a student of Shayla Ben-Habib's and so, and whose whole political, whose whole kind of project um, was around this. And I think in some ways it overshadowed the book. So we'll just say one thing that um, cosmopolitanism isn't the language of Nkrumah or any of the figures it's of the, of, um, that I write about, um, mm. but internationalism is, and internationalism as a kind of, as tied to but distinct from socialist internationalism, com communist internationalism. So 
in some ways, another way of, so what I did in the book was to try and say, here's a tradition of internationalism. Here is how it can speak to, um, a cause, a, to the kind of contemporary conversation about cosmopolitanism. I think another and maybe pr more productive way to have framed it would have been to say, here is a tradition of internationalism. That's, and, th and maybe a, we should, we ought to, um, return to and reimagine internationalism as an alternative to cosmopolitanism rather than it cre rather than just um, it helping to reframe the debate about cosmopolitanism if that makes sense um, um, so I sort of wish maybe I maybe that would have been a better track for the project and it's hard for me to um, I think, again, yeah, because the way that the allusion to post-colonial cosmopolitanism in the book is really framed again as a kind of response to this literature that I was critically engaged with. And it would be worth thinking about what would it mean to um, articulate a kind of contemporary, I don't know what we would call it, uh, contemporary anti-colonial internationalism, let's say, that on its own terms rather than as a set of responses. And here I think like one beginning point would just be the kind of, as Obeno was saying earlier, the resurgence of a language of decolonization. Why is it that like 50, 50 years after the end of formal empire, decolonization as a term has um, re-entered the stage and, and, um, and and has become a language that's so productive in terms of thinking about 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 trans so, uh, political and social transformation in the world today. So I'm just going to jump in with a series of questions. So um, I got the second half of an, the earlier question from Mohammed Matala. So I'm going to rephrase. Um, Re, re say that. Can the speaker say something about the nature of current movement building and current struggle shaping your analysis in the context of how historically sh struggle has shaped where we are? In other words, rather than intellectual or elite leaders. Uh, we also have from why one recent development in the global world has been the formation of BRICS. Uh, as an alternative economic block, can we theorize it as a quote unquote re rise of self determination in the world? How do you view Brexit? Does it signal the fracturing or imploding of the international world order? How do you relate these two important geopolitical developments, i.e., BRICS and Brexit, with your book? Uh, and third question, the U.S. empire is now a police state uh, and African-Americans on the front lines. Where is the solidarity? Um, that's a question in its own. I would add, abuse my uh, place as chair and say the U.S. empire is a police state because I'm not sure that now versus there's a difference between now versus then, either recent or um, longer historically. Mm -hmm. So anyone, okay. all of you. Um, all right. Um, so the the question about current struggles um, and where I see possibilities. I mean, I do think um, that like where I end the book, sort of alluding to Black Lives Matter and and new um, new efforts, projects of new ways of reusing, using the language of decolonization. Um, yeah, there is a real gap between, of course, this, the, the states, um, statesmen account and the, these projects that look much more like the interwar period, if, you know, in, in terms of, uh, and, well, not only do they look like the interwar period, but there is, I think, a real explicit, sometimes very explicit anti-statism, um, especially in the movement for Black lives of, of a kind of very well-developed critique of state sovereignty as such, I think, in those movement spaces. So it's not just that, so in some ways there 
their um, projects that are responding to the limits of that uh, of the settlement of the post-war period, both in terms of the international settlement of the state system, but also in the United States, um, the limits of the civil rights project and the incorporation of African Americans um, as as in 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 the lang in the terms of for full formal full citizenship. Um, so. The, you know, I think there the, the these projects we ought to think about these current forms of mobilization as really kind of projects that are responding to the limits of the kind of of the world making that I describe in the book. Um, what I I mean, I think this is true that there is still no. It's not clear what the yet what what sort of institutional vision will come out of them or what forms of alternative ways of imagining either the state or, or political community or politics as such will emerge. Um, I think there are, so I just know this from the more local context of Chicago and other cities in the US, but there is a way also of thinking about politics as, as um, uh, political practices that are that kind of uh, figure the figure the future you want in the way that you engage in organizing or in the ways that you think about how to build movements um, um, so for instance the kind of centrality of intersectionality the, the critique of like um, charismatic leadership um, a model of what what organizers call leaderful movements. So that idea that there are multiple leaders and that you're cultivating kind of collective decision making. Um, various ways of thinking about, um, you know, a real interest and in investment in in land and and in in sort of forms of uh, food sovereignty, etc. That I think again have resonances in. Um, in the third world and, 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 and so so I think there th this is really interesting in terms of it's not and this is again very different from the kind of statesman figure who who do imagine politics as if they were architects who have a plan a model that they're trying to realize in the world uh, versus this form of politics where the world you want to see is imminent in the way you uh, organize and and engage in activism um, and then the, the question about BRICS and Brexit uh, I mean yeah, I, I don't I, I, I mean I don't think I wouldn't say that um, BRICS is really a continuation of this project of self-determination I mean in some ways it's it's, it reveals what Aaron was describing earlier as the kind of, um, I'm trying to remember how you put it, uh, you know, the neo-colonial kind of this, uh, a kind of neo-colonial regime. It does raise a question about whether, um, what, whether the kind of Du Boisian formulation of the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line continues to capture our own world, right? That that sort of economic, I mean, um, imper it may be that there's a unipolar world and America is, is the empire, but the structures of, of the global order are such that, um, you know, India, China, South Africa, et cetera, states that were part of, part of the world, third world at an earlier moment are also agents of, of a domination around around the world or 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 regionally um, hegemonic um, so it kind of goes to my my own sort of self-criticism comment about what the limits of race as the category and the sort of the bifurcated racial order as the story of the international how it might be limiting or obscuring about our contemporary moment um, so I'll just say that we might have to rethink that the language of empire we've inherited from that moment may, be not, may not be adequate to kind of capture our contemporary uh, international order. Um, I mean, Brexit, I, have, I think I have less to say about this. I just, I think in some ways it is a sign, it's a sign of, of course, the fraying of that 
European world order of the of the post post war period, and um, I think the question of I, I have a sort of story about the American about how American um, um, departure from the, that international order was really tied to their kind of re rejection and critique of the third world project. It's I don't know I can't say directly that 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 Brexit you could tell a similar story about Brexit but it seems in some ways that in general it fits this narrative uh, dominant now since. Donald Trump came into office and since um, Brexit that that the post-war institutions are in crisis but again I think if you tell this if you have this kind of account of decolonization at the center you have a, a way of arguing that um, that that post the post-war international institutions were never stable formations I mean they've been constantly contested and negotiated and critiqued from their very foundation um, so it's not that we've entered a new, necessarily a totally new moment of destabilization. Um, yeah, so this question about, then there was a, sorry, a question about American, America as a police state. And I mean, I think in some ways the, this moment, uh, um, the globalization of Black Lives Matter as a kind of framework as an analysis and politics you know it does seem to me that there are forms of global solidarity um, that are appearing and and also that there are ways that um of connecting for instance anti-immigration politics around the world to the question of policing um and again i think the this why policing has become such a dominant site of political contestation goes back to this deeper critique of state sovereignty and state power. Um, I do wish, I think one thing I, I wish would were the case in the US is that, that there was a more explicit um, way of tying anti-police protest to anti-imperialism and to anti-American imperialism. So you have, for instance, a whole lot of debates in the US about, about police training, US police forces being trained in Israel um, and, and, and activists tracing those connections. But there's a, a not as much connection in, in the broader story of American imperialism and the ways that it fuels the police state domestically. jump in with uh there are more questions about four more questions um from takele merid uh this is from adis ababa so how does how does the author look at the compatibility between the terms nationalism and internationalism and also related with vis-a-vis -vis the structural relationship existing between the colonizers and the colonized states. Uh, then from, we have a question to Aaron. Uh, could you throw more light on patronage and clientelism in the post-colonial, as well as the difficulty of transformation of the colonial subject to an independent global citizen? within the confines of imperialism and capitalism where dependency resides. Uh, from Dinga Sikwebu, how can the progressive aspects of the right to self-determination be maintained in the 21st century? This is vital if we consider ways in which the right has been used to promote separatist tendencies. Uh, the discussion from Arnaldo Caleche, uh, the discussion on self-determination is a theory developed between the two world wars, and it is well discussed in the book, but I would like to hear more about how you integrate the SADC as an organization, uh, Southern African Development community as an organization of Southern African countries on the issue of self-determination. Um, again, from Dinga Sikwebu, 
Milena Stereo, in his book, The Right to Self-Determination Under International Law, outlines how the right at the end of the 20th century was usurped by great powers. Okay. Um, Aaron, do you want to take the paternal uh, patronage question? Yes, I can do so, so that you have a May break, um, Adam, to gather your thoughts on all of the other questions that have been coming to you. So um, let me answer that question quickly that was directed towards me. Um, now, um, patronage and clientelism in the post-colonial state, I think that um, the articulation of clientelism that um, I discuss in my work and I work with is largely borrowed from the political scientist Carl Stone and his work in Jamaica and the theorization of these questions in Jamaica, which is of course not to say that it is limited to there, um, but I discuss it specifically in the Caribbean context. And I do this because I think clientelism will of course take different forms in different contexts. One of the fascinating things of the Caribbean polity, for example, and speaking of Anglophone Caribbean polity, um, is the intimacy of tyranny and the tyranny of intimacy. These very small polities and what actually, how power can secure its rule in these very small states. As I laconically um, used to tell um, some friends of mine who were stunned at it, I said, um, you know, there are a number of Caribbean elections which are decided by as few as under 500 votes, you know, spread across different constituencies. So you'd have elections in which there are 30 seats and it's decided 1713, and it's really 200 votes um, in key constituencies that separate them. Um, this means that Caribbean states and um, Caribbean statecraft and the elites that dominate us can I, cannot ignore huge swathes of a population as they do in the US. Um, I always remember the 2000 US election and Bush versus Gore. And I visited Sylvia Winter at her house in, um, she was still living at Stanford at that time. And she looked at me and smiled and said, you know, when the elites start to fight, you see exactly how fair the system is isn't it? Because before then, we didn't really have a conscious idea of how many thousands of votes just weren't being counted. Um, so um, more directly back to you, um, clientelism will take different forms um, in different spaces. Of course, some of the dynamics are similar. The use of state resources to um, uh, prop up certain constituencies, to prop up certain um, select groups of people, um, which is completely against any um, notion of good governance or um, reasonable distribution of governmental, um, governmental resources. Um, it certainly um, perpetuates a situation in which post-colonial subjects are being educated into the dependency of post-colonial elites rather than any kind of uh, possibility of self-determination on their own. Um, these are some of the dynamics I would suggest are um, uh, present there in terms of the way that clientelism works, at least in the context of the Caribbean. Okay. Um... I'll take the nationalism, internationalism question first. Um, uh, you know, I think another sort of narrative that the book was trying to push against, and at least in this in the story, and this is one again that develops in a narrative that's that was articulated for the interwar period uh, by scholars of Black internationalism, was but was to kind of question the disaggregation of nationalism and internationalism um, such that and that kind of um, all nationalisms are kind of narrow that they're uh, parochial that they're necessarily kind of inward facing and um, the narrative of the book tries to make the case for at least the, the way that the question of national independence had to be posed in this question of international hierarchy propelled, a, I think, a lot of thinkers to uh, embody a more internationalist perspective. Now, that range of that internationalism, as, as we've kind of been discussing on the panel, 
is much wider than the one that I present, right? As I say, I think in the introduction of the book, this is a moment where, at least for this set of figures, it is an internationalism of nation states, basically. Whereas there's, there's these other kind of moments where um, internationalism is uh, not, yet yeah, not one of the nation states. So I'm currently working, for instance, on on um, Garveyism of the 20s and uh, of the 1920s period. And that is a moment where, I mean, of Garvey and Garveyism is often, again, dismissed as a form of black nationalism, but it is a black nationalism that's necessarily internationalist and transnational in its scope and its imagination and its concep conception of what, what the black nation is. Um, so I'm really interested in, in um, the ways that these uh, categories bleed into each other. And I think, again, they bleed into each other because of what I was saying about um, the scope and the global scope of Pan-Africanism or, or, or something like a Black world, that if you really take the story that Du Bois and others do, that the modern world is made from the moment of the slave trade, from the dispersal of African peoples, that um, that there's a way in which I don't, blackness kind of generates an internationalism or a global globalization or a global vision. Um, so for me, that's the way that I think about uh, you know the connection between nationalism and internationalism in that context. Um, the, and this kind of feeds into the question about the right to self-determination and the ways it becomes um, a, it becomes quickly tied to secessionist politics and separatism. And I think there is, um, and that's sort of a, a, a kind of the political science version of the story about nationalism being necessarily parochial and, and exclusionary, et cetera. But I sort of wonder, in some ways, whether the separatist vision or the separatist impulses of, of self-determination have less to do with nationalism as such than with the state form. I mean, what figures are fighting for in separatist claims and, and secessionist claims is for their own state. They want state power. And, and in some, some cases, as, as is true in the kind of context of the Congo, um, the deferred own state, once a vision of a more decentralized federal model is no longer available within the, within the politics of the Congo. So, so what I'm trying to suggest is that um, it may be that kind of detangling self-determination from the state form would get us would move us beyond a certain form of uh, separatist and secessionist politics. I mean, I think in some ways, the after this, the kind of this project closes in the 1970s, in some ways, the most globally, the most instructive forms of, of politics around self-determination in our time are from indigenous, ind indigenous movements for self-determination across the world for whom the aspiration is never the state necessarily, but different ways of articulating and imagining autonomy and self-rule. Um, so I would say that's one way of retaining a kind of um, the progressive or emancipatory vision of self-determination is that is to disentangle it from the sovereign form and to try to think about, well, if the aspiration is self-rule, uh, what would be the different visions and, and models of self-rule that do not necessarily, that don't necessarily have to be tied uh, to the state. Um, and there was also the question about uh, SADC. Um, I, I'm not sure, I'll say that, you know, I think one challenge, I mean, I think of SADC, ECOWAS, all these kind of regional, forms of functional and economic integration are basically emerge after the end of the Federalist projects. And that's true of the Caribbean as well. Uh, so they're, they're kind of um, settlements that seek to have some forms of integration, 
but not ones that leave intact and full the sovereign the sovereignty of the member states. I guess I would say that just one. Um, I think one important lesson about the debate, the debate around federation that I reconstruct in the book is, is this kind of, I think, accurate prediction that forms of economic or functional integration that don't have a political dimension will just exacerbate inequality, right? And you see that in SADC and other, other kind of formations that there's a regional hegemon. In the case of SADC, South Africa, then there's deep inequalities that a structure of functional integration not only keeps intact, but actually reproduces and exacerbates. Um, that you would, in order to mitigate this, you would need um, forms of economic distribution. And if you had economic distribution, you would need a, for, a political form at that regional level that could engage in forms of economic redistribution. I'll say this about, in relation to what I was saying about thinking that there's a vision of international politics that comes out of Africa and the Caribbean that's different from the European story. It's important to me to, to think that the European Union is being formed and articulated at the same moment that these models of regional federation are being debated in Africa and the Caribbean. And it seems to me that one, that this insight about, about in, forms of regional integration exacerbating inequality is something that this set of interlocutors in the African and Caribbean context are ahead of the game on. Um, that's, and I think in, someone had asked about Brexit earlier, that is in part the inability to resolve this internal question about how political integration uh, coincides with economic integration that has exacerbated the tensions within the European Union. And that creates the similar kinds of dilemmas, I think, in SADC and other, other forms of regional integration. I think those were the three. Yes, we have uh, another question from uh, Maurits. World is, of course, not only a political construct, but also fundamentally philosophical. In the dominant liberal itinerary, this can be traced to Kantian perpetual peace, which frames a particular kind of cosmopolitanism. In the book, however, world is taken as, as a transparent term. Its philosophical grounds and the way thinkers, them, thinkers read them, the way thinkers themselves read and try to trouble them left un, unexamined. I wonder what the stakes of this uh, become when the dominant liberal frame is de facto left intact. Um, and given the time that we have, I just want to um, ask you to speak, uh, Adam, about when you're speaking about moving on to the next project in terms of Garveyism. And it took me back to something that um, both Aaron and Obenawa pointed to, Aaron's phrase, I think, was um, internal class repression. Just for me, um, that and the response to Garvey and Garveyism, uh, you were referring to the way in which Garveyism is often um, derided in certain settings. And I think that does have something to do with the class question. Um, in relation to thinking about blackness on a global on in, in a glo in in global terms. So I'll leave those questions. Okay, great. Um, yes, thank, um, thanks for both of those. Uh, I think on the term uh, in terms of the term world itself, I agree that the kind of uh, philosophical underpinnings of world and and world making are, are left kind of, um, you know, I'm mute on those questions in the book. I would say, I think in terms of whether, how, whether and how this project of anti-colonial world making inherits the liberal conception that the, um, that uh, Moritz is, is talking about, I, I would say two things. I think one, um, there's one way in which it does and one way in which it doesn't. I think the way that it does, as I was saying earlier, 
is the way that the kind of state individual analogy and the ways that the international is conceived as basically the state as persons, um, that's one way in which I think there is a kind of deep continuity between that liberal and um, an 18th century framing of the international order and this earlier moment. And I think one, um, you know, there are many dilemmas or problems that that analogy generates, uh, but one of them is around this question of class repression, internal class repression, and the chapter on the NIEO to articulate some of this, that, you know, in this framing of the post-colonial state itself as constituting the workers of the world, uh, that it completely displaces that like a language of the actual workers of the world. And, and it, it, it's articulated at the very moment in which there's an attempt um, to constrain and de de delimit and repress the you know, politics of independent, independent trade union politics in these, in these countries. So that's just one, I think, dilemma of, of, of that language, but it's not, certainly not the only one. Um, but I think one way that it, it does depart from um, the Kantian framework, and I agree the Kantian framework is the dominant one for contemporary cosmopolitans, is that it doesn't treat the international order from this perspective. And I think, you know, the African Kate, the story of post-colonial Africa or the Caribbean is one that actually interstate war, I mean, there's been many wars, uh, but interstate war is not the dominant or primary dilemma that international politics has to resolve. looks like to write a political theory of, of popular pan-Africanism. Um, and, and I th think you're right about this, the kind of ways in which the critique of Garveyism is also a critique of, of working class, working class movements um, or working class people in some ways. Um, so uh, I just finished the kind of first chapter and which looks at kind of um, the conventions, the annual conventions. And it's very striking that e almost every black newspaper of this period, whether it's a more kind of Marxist or socialist paper like A. Philip Randolph's uh, or kind of, or Du Bois's crisis, all are fixated on Garveyism as a crowd politics, as mob politics. So there's this kind of fixation and anxiety about the mass, mass about the masses and about, about the ways in which they may be duped. And there's a whole set of languages that's kind of paternalistic. And, um, but of course, this also comes at a moment, I think, where it's, Garvey himself is kind of very, um, you know, conservative around class politics, uh, uh, very much distancing himself uh, from socialist politics of the period, um, and and you know, at times supporting strike action, at times you know, very explicitly not supporting strike action, and of course, his own vision of the economy is not is not a post capitalist uh, vision. So. Yeah, I think it's, it, I, I mean, I'm just beginning getting, to, getting started, but I think the other thing that the Garveyite project and, and generally the interwar period allows us to access is a way of thinking about the racialization of the world order that gets us away from the problem of black sovereign states, basically, or not fully, but the primary site of racialization is, is labor. And it's really interesting to me that it's spaces of, of um, Caribbean migrant labor that become the site of the most um, significant, um, you know, uh, UNIA chapters in Cuba, especially, but across across other sites in the Caribbean. So, um, with that, uh, I think we're going to thank Adam for. 
really, um, as Aaron put it, uh, uh, an ambitious and wide-reaching book. Um, for those who haven't read it, uh, be sure to get um, a copy and, and read it. It's, it's an important contribution to Black um, political thought. Uh, thank you to our other panelists, Aaron Kemagisha and Obenwa Ponza, for engaging um, the book and giving us your time. Um, I just want to also flag that on August 28th, we will have a seminar on revolution and disenchantment, Arab Marxism and the Binds of Emancipation, given by Fadi Adewal. And if you have any questions on that, you want some more information, I believe you can email other universals admin at UWC. Um, but that information will go up on the Facebook page and uh, the, the poster will be circulated. Thank you so much for the panel, Adam, um, and you. the book. Look forward to more. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Adam. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Siren, were you putting up your hand because you wanted to jump in here? Okay. No, no, I just wanted to wave and say thanks. I don't. Thank you. Yes, we can.